Hello, everybody. This is the uh, February 3rd, uh, 2021 uh, meeting of SIG Auth. We have a pretty full agenda today, and I know that um, pot security policy replacement has been uh, uh, kicked off of previous meetings, or I guess the last meeting was canceled. So. Uh, I will, I'm going to time box the other things. Um, and I think we should also discuss whether we want to have uh, breakout sessions while uh, PSP V2 is um, hot just to kick off that work stream. Um, so yeah, let's try to uh, get through the polls of note. Um, and announcements in the first 10 minutes. Do you want to kick off this first announcement, Jordan? Um, you can read it. And here's right, the previous right. two nine features have to be implementable and be tracked by then. So if you are working on one for 121, have it in by then and make sure that some of the SIGOF leads know to put it into the spreadsheet. That's it. Cool. Uh, Ma Rosette, do you want to um, yeah, intro hi. your kit? Yeah, um, so this is, we're continuing with uh, Windows uh, Privileged Containers. Um, I think we brought this kept to um, the Segoth, a couple Segoth meetings in 120. And there were a couple of kind of design changes that um, I can highlight here to keep things brief. Um, but we wanted to just I think we're, we are pursuing getting this into an implementable state in alpha, and I wanted to circle back and just make sure we're in alignment with, uh, with, with SIGAuth around all of the security policies. When we last discussed this, there was a plan to just reuse the existing security context.privileged field. Um, after a number of discussions with um, SIGNODE and uh, kind of internal discussions, I think we're deciding to in, uh, introduce a new field on the Windows security context options. I've highlighted some of the, the reasons in the, the KEP, but from a very high level, um, the, the, the reasons why we're doing that is one, um, there's no pod wide security context that privileged field today. And for the Windows secure or privileged containers, we need to have all of the, the containers in a pod be privileged or not privileged. And because we can't know at kind of API validation time if a pod is intended to be scheduled to a Windows node or a Linux node, we feel that it's much more clear and kind of uh, highlights user intent if there's a new field on Windows, the Windows security context. We are actually deciding to not call it privileged as well um, for our, a number of reasons that are also mentioned in there. The big one, the biggest one being that these containers will work and have vastly different capability. They'll work quite differently and have vastly different capabilities than Linux privileged containers. So we wanted to avoid kind of all confusion that we usually see where people who are more familiar with Linux come in and assume things work the same way with Windows and um, maybe not go through all of the documentation. And so we're still kind of bike shedding a little bit on the name, but right now we're calling them host process containers. And that's a little bit of a uh, carryover from how they're implemented in which, and the cap goes into a lot of detail about that, um, where essentially these privileged containers are packaged up like containers, but are actually run as a kind of an isolated uh, Windows job object on the host and the processes run kind of in the host namespace. Um, so, we uh, just wanted to kind of bring this to uh, uh, like raise awareness for this and see if there's any discussions that need to happen. I believe when we discussed this in 120, um, members of the SIGOTH community kind of felt that if we were re reusing the existing privileged fields, um, there wouldn't really wasn't much concern here. Um, but we are since we are changing that, I wanted to just kind of have a chance for everybody to review and provide feedback. I'd probably direct that to the design itself just to keep this time boxed. Um, I, I, I had made a comment about um, there are existing policy things that look at privilege, the privilege field sort of as a stand-in for you're a powerful pod. And so if a new field that shows up will definitely get missed by existing policy enforcement mechanisms that 
think they're keeping out privileged or powerful things. So that that's my main concern. I, I haven't revisited the uh, design since you made the updates, so I'll take a look at it. Now, for Windows pods, has that ever been true, though? Right? Like, as I remember it, the Windows pods doesn't they don't work with the security context the same way. That's the big, that's that's one thing that we went back and forth with between Signode and, and um, myself and SigWindows here. Um, there is no concept of privileged fields today in in Windows, in even in with uh, Docker, I believe. So outside of Kubernetes. Um, the other reason, which I, I forgot to mention earlier, um, but I do want to highlight here too, is that the main way of, rest of restricting access to host resources with these privileged container fields is the, the run as username and or um, credential spec fields that already exist on the Windows security context. And we kind of felt that having those live on the same object as the new field um, would kind of potentially outweigh the um, the risk of having these missed by new policy enforcement. And we're hoping that with a lot of documentation and reaching out to those policy enforcement tools, we can get them to kind of support Windows in a more kind of Windows focused way instead of uh, kind of cramming it in. Maybe, maybe I can ask like a more specific question. Um, if, if I want to prevent say host network access, uh, that's gonna be listed for say a Linux pod in the security context. Um, or, or peer to it. Um, in Windows, does it control the same thing? Like if I'm controlling those fields for Windows pods, does it make sense today already? Or is it already the case today that like- The answer, try... yeah, the answer to that is a big mixed bag. And we have a big table in the in the cap about what's supported. So the kind of security constructs for Windows act a lot differently. Yeah. So and... the reason it's important is that a concern about like, oh, if someone's already enforcing constraints on privileged pods, they're doing it here. Like if, if the things that matter for security on Windows pods already don't honor that, those things are already broken, Jordan. Like it doesn't matter. In, in, the, in, the, in the case for Windows or for host network specifically, so host network doesn't work on Windows today. Um, there, that was actually discussed in some of the, in, in the kept comments. There, you, it, there, it's, there's a very hacky way of getting it to work with Docker shim that requires you to manually configure well-named or certain named host networks on the, the node um, and container D it doesn't support. Where applicable, we would like to reuse the same fields and host name or host network. Um, we are, uh, I've commented here that, um, so initially these privileged containers will always um, inherit or must always be joined to a host network. And in cases like that, we are going to enforce in API validation and in particular, or, and in the kubelet check to um, some checks in the kubelet that though that existing kind of security context fields that do um, have that, that, that are useful or applicable to these new pod types will also be validated. Yeah, it seems like this is the same problem that uh we were facing when we were talking about the first versions of PSP where uh, these constraints aren't portable and we can't really guarantee compatibility of, I guess, the security guarantees from release to release. I don't think that is particularly surprising to me um, and seems like uh, documentation and uh, action required to the common policy engines uh, or I guess policy library maintainers is a reasonable course of action to get over this. Um, so sometimes fields are just really difficult to reason about, right? Like some pieces of this security context will work when applying to Windows. Almost seems worse to me than zero pieces of this security context will work when applied to Windows. Um, I think I agree with that. Like the pod spec feels like it was designed with Linux specifically in mind and feels very Linux specific. And so, you know, if, if it were redesigned to be completely platform agnostic, then it would be a fair bit more complex. 
um, but these questions would be easy to answer. Uh, but it's it's not, and nobody's talking about burning down all of pod spec in order to make sure that Linux and Windows pods are on an equal footing as far as how much they're respected by the pod spec. But yeah, it it does seem like accepting that the pod spec is very Linux specific and then putting all of the Windows things to be separate from the Windows things or a Windows pod. Yeah, that also seems that also seems like a thing. And actually, we, we're running into we're, we're having the same discussions in the CRI spec too. And this cap actually does address that right now. There's a Linux our pod sandbox config field. There's a Linux uh, security like container security context and pod security context field. And with this cap, we're um, introducing and have kind of the like the SIGNOTE reviewers acknowledge this and think that this is the way forward. We're introducing Windows specific fields for all of those and mapping them to that. I don't think that we necessarily wanted to kind of tackle the whole pod, like pod spec level changes with, with this cap. Um, but if there's a desire to do that, we can maybe keep moving forward here or with um, that. But we are, we are seeing a lot of, the, we're seeing more and more instances of that where a lot of the fields, we're, we're having a hard time trying to decide if we should try and kind of mash the Windows constructs into the existing API structure or break that out. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's review the changes offline. Um, sure. I'm not, uh, not, nothing you said sounds terribly concerning to me, but uh, maybe Jordan, David can weigh in on the cap um, and whoever else uh, has thoughts. Um, let's breathe, let's, uh, check out this node service uh, log viewer. I, I took a quick look at this. Um, do you want to intro it and uh, tell us what the uh, implementation of the alpha timeline is that you're looking at? Do you want to take this, Arvind? Yeah, yeah sure. I can do that. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Arvind. I work at Red Hat, leading the efforts for enabling Windows workloads on Kubernetes slash OpenShift at Red Hat. So, what we're trying to do here is uh, OpenShift has a feature that allows us to view node logs from journal services, which we have now extended to, all, to also support Windows services. And we would like to upstream that. And the way we're trying to upstream that after talking to the six CLI folks is to extend kubectl uh, logs to also work with nodes. And leverage the existing war log endpoint, which is already present in the kubelet to also work with um, in, in particular system D services. And on the Windows side, work with a, a slew of Windows supported um, services like you know that log to the application logs, the system logs, ETW, uh, or even, even files. Um, and I think Mark was suggesting that we bring this to you folks to ensure that you know we're thinking about it from a security perspective. Yeah, today on Windows, uh, today there's no uh, kind of equivalent of journal CTL for, for Windows nodes. And this would allow um, potentially folks to grab arbitrary Windows event logs, um, which may or may not contain, I mean, sensitive information. It's definitely higher risk than not exposing those. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that all of the kind of echoing and everything is is considered and um, raised and reviewed. Sounds good. And what's the, um, are you trying to get this in implementable state by the enhancement freeze? Yes. Um, I believe, so this has been discussed in SIGnode, um, SIG CLI, SIG Windows, and now SIG Auth. Um, the cap outlines changes to the, the kubelet to stream these logs, and that will be, um, hopefully that's going to be gated by a feature gate. And then there were also questions on how to kind of, um, and then make the same, make similar changes in the kubectl to be able to also like relay those um, to, to users. And we would like to have this in an alpha state for 121. Um, a very high level question. 
what's what are back is checked when you try to make this call like what permissions must you have before you can start scraping node logs is it just node slash logs or is it something magical i don't remember so from what we understood from the sig cli folks is given the minute you add support for viewing node objects in when you extend kubectl logs they whatever our back is 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 present for those objects and those endpoints will apply here too we don't need to do anything extra is what i've understood that sounds correct i was more asking like what permission do you need and who like has it i'm just trying to understand as like just on like a standard install of cube cluster who can do this other than cluster admin um Which we are trying to restrict this only to the cluster admin. Right. Um, okay. Uh, I will, uh, I think people should uh, review this offline, hopefully in the next uh, soon, considering uh, we're coming up on the enhancement freeze. Um, but I haven't looked uh, much in detail, so I can't uh, comment on it yet. I will try to formulate some opinions. Um, anybody else have any closing remarks on pools of note? Cool, so... Um, PSP, who wants to kick this discussion off? T Tim, Tabitha, are you here? Tim? Do you want to? Uh, <laughs> the, the a lot of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess we have uh, we have two different proposals out right now, um, but maybe before we well, um, no, I changed my mind on that. Uh, I think it's worth having a, the beginnings of a discussion, and then uh, we can see where we are in half an hour and uh, or however much time Mike wants to give us and um, figure out uh, next steps and whether we need a more of a breakout session to to get through this. Um, but yeah, right now we have um, two different proposals um, out. Uh, one, um, uh, so the PSP++ proposal that's up right now, if you haven't had a chance to see it, um, the I would say that the uh, high level objective of this is to take something that's similar to um, pod security policy as it is today and clean it up, try and fix um, a bunch of the problems that we've called out with that proposal um, and put forward something that is uh, similar, not quite so similar as to be an actual pod security policy v2. Um, uh, but um, uh, something that's close enough that someone who already is already familiar with pod security policy should be able to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, the second proposal, uh, the bare minimum pod security policy, takes a different approach um, and says, uh, tries to address the issue of um, what is the bare minimum that we need built into Kubernetes out of the box to prevent uh, create pod permissions from being equivalent to root on cluster, short of some container vulnerability. Um, and uh, it's not configurable beyond just enforcing that bare minimum, either enforcing or not enforcing at a namespace level, the that bare minimum policy. Um, and the idea there is that once you move beyond the need for that bare minimum, uh, then we expect uh, users to go to all the way to some um, 
more advanced third-party plugins such as OPA or Gatekeeper or Kaverno. So then jumping off of what Tim said, ultimately these are both kind of walking in the same direction of giving something that is out of the box and easy to use for simple use cases in order to ensure that folks who lack either the, the, the sophistication or the desire to go to something more like, a, like an external policy controller can still have a feeling of running a normal pod is consuming a fungible compute resource rather than you know, giving an SSH session to, as root to every node in the cluster. Um, and like ultimately the distinction between the two of them is how sophisticated of a use case does a user have to have before they make that jump into an external admission controller? Um, you know, because like pod security policy, one of the one of the issues, one of the philosophical issues with it was that it was so flexible but didn't offer any guidance, didn't offer any like out of the box policies that could be adopted. And so it was kind of stuck in the middle there where the advantage of being out of the box was kind of lost. Like you needed to have the same sophistication to adopt it as you needed to to adopt one of these one of these external things. And so from that point of view, I would be super happy to see either one of these proposals land and get implemented in order to fill in that less complicated part of the market and give give safety to folks who aren't going to go to using an external policy engine and you know which how how much flexibility we want to give them how how soon in a growth of sophistication journey they have to jump to an external controller is is essentially the decision that that we need to make if we're trying to choose between these two between these two policies and that's not really a question with a right answer so so therefore i was hoping that we could all have our feelings out about it and and get to a point where we felt good about choosing one yeah just to add i think there's some um you know to what Tabitha said about there not being a right answer. Um, there's a bunch of trade-offs in that. And you know, the more the more advanced we make the out-of-the-box solution, the long sort of the longer that users will be able to stay on that. Um, but also in my opinion, the longer they stay on that, the harder the transition to another controller becomes. Um, another, uh, another question that I'd be interested in getting some feedback on is um, how much can we do to reduce the burden of running a third party controller um, and make it make that piece a lot easier um, and address some of the problems around running third-party controllers. Isn't that something that's not in our real house though? That's that's pretty squarely sounds like SIG API machine learning. Uh, not entirely, right? You have to have a way to avoid using the anything you build in uh, in order to have an on-ramp, right? Like if, you, if you're already using the built-in thing, you need to expand, you have to have a way to transition from one to the other, and that's gonna be in the design of this admission plugin and API. Are you saying yeah. migration from one policy engine to bigger, better policy engine? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can see that if I'm a cluster admin and I've realized, well, that's not working so well, um, I'm gonna wanna have 
and on ramp to it as opposed like you, to a cliff. Normally, you, you need some way to sort of have an exception or, or punch a hole in the policy. Like normally, the, the ramp is the, the built in thing that's simple is working well. And then I come up with an exceptional case. And now I need to, I realize the built in thing doesn't work for my exceptional case. I need to exempt this namespace and then fall back on some external thing. And so we, we have to build something that makes it possible or easy to do that without sort of tearing down all the other things in your cluster that were actually working well with the built-in thing. So if I, I, I thought even Tim's proposal for like a very small thing could at the very least say a particular namespace could run anything it wanted, right? Yeah, I think that's good. I'm, I'm not saying this is a hard, necessarily a difficult thing to do. Uh, I am saying that when APIs are designed and the ambition plugins are written, this sort of change needs to be taken into account. Yeah, so my, my comment had been more around the idea of making it easier to run external policy engines, right? And to me, that is the API machinery problem, right? Like, like the, theoretically, if I could easily run uh, OPA as a static pod guaranteed in a way that the only way that the Cube API server couldn't talk to it is if it if the actual like they were scheduled together and they both blew up at the same time okay fine nothing works anymore uh but there's no like random case of like my opa can't work because it can't schedule itself and there's a circle in my dependency graph right like like that's the nice thing that psp has over everything else today right there's no circle in a dependency graph i mean i think that even if you were to build that uh, and it is possible to write a static pod controller, right? Like a workload controller that creates static pods for you. Um, that it, you would still need to design the the first API uh, to give you an on ramp instead of a cliff. Yeah, I'm not as sure about that. Like going going back to Tim's comment about the more advanced users of the out of the box software are going to have trouble moving on to a different thing. Um, I, I disagree because to make advanced use of an out of the box thing, like even PSP today, um, fundamentally requires you to understand what your workloads are and what kinds of restrictions you want to put on them first in a philosophical way and then translate that into, into those policies. And so you've already done the hard work then switching to a third party controller is a matter of learning the syntax for that third party controller and deciding how to implement those same feelings in it. Um, and so like, I feel like if they've made sophisticated use of, of one controller, moving to another controller is mostly operational problems rather than the the more hard like business or philosophical problems um and if we have a flexible built-in option like like what's in the psp plus plus option then if a separate third-party controller wants to capture that market share of saying people who want to move beyond beyond psp plus plus um the the PSP plus pluses are in their cluster already. They could write a tool that would translate from from PSP plus pluses into whatever their policy object is, um, and that feels like they're the ones that have the uh, incentive to do so, rather than rather than us. You know, there could be fifteen different commercial options for Kubernetes policy controllers. Um, but I, I don't think it's on us to write a translator into all of their different policy languages. But like Gatekeeper has done quite a bit of work to make it easier for people to transition from PSP to Gatekeeper with the, uh, with the work that they've done in their policy library. And I have actually used that and it wasn't trivial, but it was less work than the initial figuring out what the policies are and how to apply them without hurting the users. He said. Um, 
let me try to capture that. Um, uh, I guess the uh, your point is that that is potentially um, should be their responsibility if they want to capture um, some section of users of PSP plus plus or uh, the out of the box solution versus ours, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, we also ship KubeNet, but we don't ship tools to make it easy to move from KubeNet to Calico and KubeNet to Cilium and, and so on. But the providers of those tools, as part of their finding product market fit, you know, they, they're trying to figure out who are the users that aren't using them already and want to, and, and what are their needs and providing tools to address those needs. Right. So I think um, the migration is, I think it is also uh, only one of a number of problems with running third-party admission controllers. Um, so. They're scary, because you take this thing and you intentionally make it an important part of your ability to do anything. And yeah. Yeah, our design can clearly make that scarier or less scary. And if the barrier to entry is annotate a namespace and it's less scary, I, I would take that barrier to entry as a for instance, I don't need to write their policy for them, but I do want to make it possible so someone can do this and not be afraid that it's going to suddenly do something wacky. I mean, I feel like both the bare minimum and the, the PSP++ proposals do have a way that you could run in like a two-legged mode like that. Um, because in, in either case, if you want to have both policy engines running without fighting each other, you decide on a namespace by namespace basis which policy engine you want to be quote unquote active for that namespace and then in the other policy engine you make it fully privileged you know so like within bare minimum you would annotate all of your third party namespaces as privileged allowed or whatever um and in uh in psp plus plus you would you would bind the privileged out of the box policy into that namespace I don't need to design it here. I just want to make sure that when people are, are designing this, they see it as a goal uh, to to make this less scary for cluster admins. So when, when we had um, talked about <clears throat> like taking sort of PSP, the good parts, uh, the PSP++ uh, proposal um, actually kept more of PSP than I was expecting. I, I felt like it kept PSP the good parts and also the mediocre parts. And then it, it cut out the binding thing. Like the binding thing was the really bad part. So I was glad to see that go. Um, all I feel like all of the discussions about like, do we have a different object name or do we have a different object version? Like. If, if we were actually going to keep schema compatibility with the existing PSP API, maybe deprecating the fields that were specifically for mutating pods, um, I would actually, I, I could see our way to having a second admission plugin that looked at the same API and got bound a different way, like treated, used different binding objects to decide what policies applied. If we were happy with the PSP API, like as a going forward, this is the API we will maintain and add to and keep uh, matching the pod spec. Um, I'm not convinced that's the API we want to keep and maintain and like sort of perpetually expand to match new fields that come into pod spec. So it feels like that's sort of the main question to answer first. I think it's miserable, but inevitable because pod spec is itself pretty huge and sprawling. 
and will continue to change. And anything that wants to enforce policy over PodSpec will have to reflect that complexity somehow. And so like using the gatekeeper library example, one, one way to do that is each time PodSpec gets more complicated, you have to add more policies to your cluster. Um, or the other way to handle that is the, the PSP way, where each time PodSpec gets more complicated, you have to add more fields to your policy object. Um, but I would love to hear a third way, but I don't think there is a third way. I think as long as PodSpec is miserable, all of us who are yoked to it will also be miserable. And the best thing that we can hope to do is ship something that makes that easier to digest for users. I, the thing I'm wondering, I, and I'm, we, we've struggled with this with PSP from the beginning. Like, what what is the philosophy of pod security policy? Like, what decides whether it cares about a field or not? So you can do things with pods. Like, you can set spec node name. You can say, I'm going to create a pod, and I want to run on that node. Like you can express a preference about what node you want. And pod security policy doesn't control that. Um, you can say, I have pod anti-affinity and I require like to run at high priority, not scheduled with pods in these namespaces. So you can do things that like disrupt names, pods and other namespaces, dis disrupt scheduling of pods and other namespaces. And pod security policy doesn't have an opinion about that. While security policy is like, you can't mount the host, you can't run privilege, you can't run host network. I haven't seen, and I mean, it's, I was one of the ones who helped come up with PSP. So we didn't come up with a particularly coherent philosophy of what exactly does is the line for like what pod security policy includes. Um, the more API we expose, the more policy API we expose, um, it's, not an unreasonable assumption. Like if I lock, if I came up with a PSP and locked my cluster down, I thought I locked my cluster down. I would not expect pods to suddenly become more powerful, like in the next release, and like expose all these additional holes. So I would expect the policies that I wrote last release to still be locking my namespaces and pods down. Um, and we we really struggled with like a a pol a PSP manifest from you know last year must not get more permissive or less permissive. And like how different people had different opinions on that. Different clusters had different opinions on like, oh yeah, that's clearly a more powerful pod. You can't allow it. Like, oh no, that's unrelated to pod security. You should just allow whatever there. Like, so if if we're going to go down the road of maintaining this sort of sprawling API that maps one-to-one-ish with pod spec, I think we need to describe what that what that philosophy is like what decides whether it goes in here or not and what an existing policy object will do for new fields that show up in policy. Do you think that what's in the documents that talks about that philosophy for the for the proposals fails to provide that kind of philosophical grounding? Because like the way that I have seen it, a lot of the problems that that you described as being potentially in scope are are inherent to the flexibility of of kubernetes but not not really pod issues they're more like what do you let people do with your with your api kind of kind of issues and so like i don't know i could maybe see like a cluster security policy that would have uh, that would have opinions or scheduling security policy that would have opinions on those things but like, I was really thinking of, you can't break out of the container as the scope and, and tried to make that clear when I was, when I was writing. Um, but I mean, what, what do you, what do you think there? Like, well, like, I think there's layers of problems here and, and we can't solve all of them, but we do need to be clear about which ones we're trying to solve and why I agree. Well, and, and I think like you're bringing up the cluster policy is a good um, it's a good way of like saying what we probably need to reject is we can't create something that closes over all possible complexity. So we can't 
we can't define a cluster policy because it would be intractable and then someone would add an extension that breaks it. So whatever the scope is, um, we thought about policy as primitives that would be used. Originally, that's a little bit of the, uh, you know, if we share some mindset from that. But if we flip it around and say something as concrete as what you just described as the goal of deleting, you know, preventing, preventing a X from doing Y, uh, because that is a reasonable expectation. Uh, and then there's a set of problems that are unbounded that are left as an exercise to the integrator because integrators could bring in um, a, a, a volume plugin that is completely insecure and that's not our fault. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not a worthy problem to solve, but it's probably, we need to set that scope boundary pretty clearly. I think the points where I had difficulty um, understanding what what is the policy doing around things like uh, host path mounts or CSI, like allowed CSI drivers, like things that you can't actually reason about just their existence. Like you could put, you could give a read only host path mount to, you know, Etsy hosts or something. And that doesn't let you escape the container. That that's just injecting a useful, you know, hosts file. Um, but if you host mount a read-only volume to like Kubelet PKI, well, now you've got node credentials. And so the the what is exposed by the API of PSP lets you express um, a wide variety of policies that you can't actually look at programmatically and say, yeah, this, this is protecting against container breakout. Um, similarly for CSI drivers, right? Like you can say, I allow C to CSI driver, foobar and baz, and those are extension points that who knows what foobar baz do in that cluster. Um, and so by having the API surface be bigger and more expressive than what we really want to express like the pod security standards. Um, we're inviting people to use it to express all kinds of policies like all along the spectrum. Uh, and that seems to be straying past the like protect against container breakouts in a reasonable way and give a good ramp to like more complicated policies. Um, that's part of what makes it so hard to reason about the policies that other people write that they have in their clusters that we don't have visibility to. We don't know actually what their intent was. Maybe they thought they were fully locked down. Privileged always means privileged, but some of these are much more complicated than that. Yeah, like I've seen crazy ones that like allow lots of different host paths, but read only and like really particular CSI drivers. And like, it's hard to know what the intent of the policy author was when we're considering like a new pod field. Like um, for the built-in ones, uh, it's a little easier to understand. So like if you say you can mount a secret, then it's also reasonable to let you mount a projected volume with a secret data source. Like that was that was a thing we did in PSP where you know, projected volumes came along and it's like, well, if your policy lets you mount a secret, then it's also reasonable to let you mount a secret a different way, even though you didn't explicitly opt into projected volumes, right? Um, so because we understand sort of the meaning of those things, we can be more intent driven in how we apply the policy. But the more low level you make your the policy primitives, um, the harder it is to understand the intent behind what they were doing. And so like my, my ideal would be something with a small surface area, small API surface area that we could tie to like the pod security standards, maybe a little more than Tim's. Like I kind of like having some level of versioning, like this was version one of the baseline or version one of the restricted, um, but not sort of this, we're going to have an API around every API on a pod spec. Uh, because it, the PSP API is actually more complicated than the pod spec API for the fields that it addresses, right? Like uh, your pods have 
add capabilities or drop capabilities. And PSP has like additional fields, like here's what should be defaulted to, and you must drop these. Or, like the policy has to be more expressive usually than the thing it is enforcing. Good worry about the complexity. Good example there. though, that there's something really important there is that someone who writes an extension that has a security impact needs to be able to say something along the lines of, you can't use this extension and get v1 of restricted or something like that. So I think that the flip side of a more focused model like what you're talking about is that there has to be a way for someone writing that CSI plugin to say, if you use the CSI plugin, you cannot, like they have to be able to test and validate that. And that's an important thing to do, but I think that gets to scope. Um, like you have to be able to give someone a framework whereby they can assess the impact of the plugin that they're adding. And in the absence of that, you have to assume that like a, a, an administrator would need to un assume that it's um, dangerous. Um, I'd like to question, David, I, I definitely want to like keep talking about this. I'd be happy to do like a breakout session in a second meeting if people are up for that. Um, I. Or an ad hoc meeting specifically to to have our feelings about this? Yeah. Um, I'd like to propose uh, taking the alternate week slot of um, SIGOTH to move forward at least once. I um, suspect we might need more than that to move forward. And I like going to see uh, API machinery. Yeah, the opposite, the opposite spot of this is API machinery. And uh, oh. <laughs> that's a lot of the same folks. Uh, good idea, but like that's me, Jordan, Clayton, Mo. Uh, I'll, I'll skip. I'll skip API machinery. Well, I'll skip at the same time. We'll see what happens to it. <laughs> uh, should, should we do one of those poll things? Poll sounds good. Yeah, poll sounds good. Um, time poll. And uh, that's a one-off breakout for now, and then we can decide in there whether we need to repeat. Yeah, if people, I, I kind of gave my uh, made my opinion about like what the, sort of the first question to answer was. If other people have something similar, like there, there's a lot of questions and we can easily get like down into the weeds. If, if there's sort of a primary question that you have that you think we should answer, it might be good to kind of gather those. So we talk about the big questions first. Uh. Um, so on that note, if people never came up with what pod security policies philosophy was in the first place, and now we are talking around our competing philosophies of what it ought to be, might it make sense for everybody to actually take a moment to be like, what is the philosophy of pod security policy actually? And I think that a lot of these questions might be settled by that. Um, if we just like step back several steps and are like, what are we doing here? Um, I wonder if a lot of these things that we are speaking around might actually be spoken to directly if we did that. One. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, let's all come up with philosophies independently and then meet next week and compare um, the uh, authors of these two PSP docs. Do you mind uh, giving comment access to uh, Kubernetes SIG auth Google group? I believe that the PSP plus plus one has comment access to KDEV. Hmm. That is coming uh, out. Mike I'm, on a, a, I'm on a different, okay. <laughs> I, you might but I be believe right. it also has comment or maybe more powerful access to Kubernetes SIG auth and Kubernetes SIG security. I think I was yeah, on the same wrong for account. Never mind. All right. Woo, Thank woo. you. Um, all right. Let's, uh, in the last eight minutes, uh, David, do you want to do a quick um, sure. announcement of this? Uh, well, it's for discussion, actually. There's a couple different choices to decide what to do. Um, 
you know, as we built our uh, an API server that we would embed into many spots, and it's in places you wouldn't even think of, right? So, for example, the Cube Scheduler or Cube Controller Manager actually runs a server inside of it that exposes metrics, version, health Z, ready Z, live Z checks. Uh, each of these by default uses something called a delegated authorizer and a delegated authenticator. So the authenticator figures out who you are, the authorizer runs a subject access review to figure out what you have access to. Uh, these choices made a lot of sense, they work pretty well. The problem that we face now is that some endpoints get hammered. Uh, there are scrapers. Well, you can think of it like a cubelet always hits you know, health Z and ready Z over and over and over again, over again. Those are easy because they are accessible by everyone. And so we already built a special case for those configurable via a flag it came in, I don't know, three or four releases ago, maybe more. Um, but for the case of metrics, there are often scrapers that go through and they're going to be hitting this endpoint every, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, it, often they're configurable, but they're gonna get hit very, very frequently. But we always know the identity of the scraper and we know that when it hits metrics, it should be able to read metrics. Um, and you know, this is gonna be expressed today with an RBAC policy and you use a subject access review and you make a check. Uh, the question is, you know, do we wanna keep doing that? Or can we look and say, you know, scraping is a fairly common thing, metrics is common. We wanna have a policy local to a binary that says, I don't have to go out and check because I know that if user foo hits my metrics endpoint, he should be allowed. I don't need to go and ask. Because inside of my deployment, and it is gonna be deployment specific, inside of my deployment, this is expected normal and should have access. Um, I think Tim had actually identified something similar. Uh, I saw he had linked to a, P a PR comment he made a while back. Um, and so we, as we think about that, we then have to think about like what mechanism would you use to make this happen? Uh, and there have been several ideas brainstormed. Um, one is to use uh, our old friend ABAC which is actually designed as a file on disk to be local to a binary that would grant access. Uh, and it's actually well suited for this sort of a purpose where I have a very small number of rules uh, and I can express them in like two lines or less. Um, it disadvantages like people don't use ABAC anymore, but it still exists. We actually do still have it. Um, another option is to add an argument you could have a structured argument that made it work. The PR I made actually did that. Um, it's it's easy, it's constrained. It's not very expressive, so it would never grow. I don't know if you can see it as good or bad. Uh, it is kind of ugly, I will admit that. Um, another option that was suggested was to read an RBAC file, like a series of RBAC manifests off a disk, uh, you know, that, and then try to evaluate that locally with an RBAC evaluator. Um, you know, that's a, that's a well-known API, <laughs> I'll grant it that. Um, it's really big for the task. RBAC was built to create sort of extensible policy and this is, this is not that. Uh, and I guess I will mention uh, the last possibility is to create a longer auth Z cache. Just make it, I don't know, really long. The problem with that is that, that it impacts every request, uh, which is not equivalent to saying, this particular user, this endpoint, I already know the answer and it will be remain the same for all time. Um, so that's the problem, the solutions we've thought of so far. Uh, I'm open to other solutions um, or comments. I have stunned um, everyone. Since, since I made the, R, the static RBAC thing, I still think that's the best thing. But my general feeling was, if you're gonna take like, if you started using ABAC for this, I would presume you would, I don't know, make that API look like the rest of Kubernetes APIs and give it a proper like type meta version, structure it nicely, get rid of all the awful to do's in that structure. And, uh, <laughs> I'd be open to making it V1. Uh, I think I'd, I'd want to first bring it as beta and then get it on its uh, three release beta plan. Uh, and so, so my, my question with that is, if you're going to do all the work to do that, is it really, 
is it really worth it to not just use the RVAC API? Because it would totally work. It's maybe a little indirect, but at least you don't have to learn two APIs now. I see the forces of trying to build an extensible API where you can have multiple different contributors uh, at different scopes is something that RBAC was created to do and it did it very well. But I think you come up with something simpler uh, and I think ABAC is that simpler thing that would solve a hard-coded policy for four rules sort of situation. But now you're encouraging people to mix RBAC and ABAC and like, ABAC is fine, except that once you have more than three rules, you can never figure out what your rules are. Um, and so I, I am afraid, like, I'm sorry to make a slippery slope argument, but I am afraid that like the good idea about ABAC is not even once. Um, because like ABAC once is fine, except that now you're, now you're not, thinking of ABAC as that thing that's going to burn me. And so then I think it sets you up to, to start to expand your use of ABAC until eventually you hit the point where people don't use ABAC because of that reason. If it wasn't a case of a delegated authorizer where it already delegates from one to the other, uh, I would be more concerned about that. But I think what we saw in practice is that ABAC eventually went away because RBAC solved the problem better. Uh, I don't think I would see people trying to use and distribute that this way. And in fact, if you look at the use in a Cube API server today, it's pretty rare. Um, as an attacker, I would just like to say that in my experience, people stopped using ABAC not only because RBAC solved the problem better, but because people could break it six ways to next Tuesday. I guess but that was mostly it. about the like deployment model, right? And that you couldn't actually update ABAC in any reasonable way. So you left it like way over broad. Not necessarily. I mean, sort of, but not necessarily. There are multiple ways that one could go about breaking ABAC. Well, it, it I'm also on team hesitant to use ABAC, kind of for most reasons. Like, are there are there reasons that we actually want attributes or something that ABAC expresses better? I agree at like it lets you just have three rules that apply it's simpler than RBAC would. Like you need two files, you need, you need to say a binding that maps to principles as well as the role that grants the permissions. And maybe that's more complex for the use case that you need. I, I worry a little bit about it being confusing to have a static RBAC manifest with references to objects that don't actually exist in the API. Um, like you, you have a role ref to a cluster role, which only exists in the local static file. Uh, that especially gets strange when you start mixing scopes, like a namespace binding to a cluster scope thing. Um, I, the plus side of RBAC is you could try out your policy just using RBAC. And then once you're happy with it, you like get export to YAML and throw it in a static manifest. So, this like we're developing it. I kind of like it. Mixing two scopes, like oh, it's the RBAC role. Which RBAC role? A static one in a local file, or a live one in the API? I don't know. Am but I maybe, right that this is a performance? That yes, this is a this performance, is a performance optimization? optimization? It, it's, it's not, not just, just performance, performance availability. It's availability. Like, say the central delegated one that it was doing subject access review checks against is gone. And you'd really like your metrics scraper to still be able to authorize so that it can tell you that this thing is in so much trouble and it can't talk to the API server. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, to me, this looks like uh, just a case of kind of generic service to service authentication, um, which is a problem that has been solved a number of ways by uh, service meshes. And authentication. This is authorization. Sorry, authorization. Um, uh, and I think the the common way uh, to solve it in that case is to have your central policy definition and just push that definition down into uh, the endpoints to do authorization um, 
at the endpoint. And so I wonder if there's something we could build that would uh, basically do just that, where it says, you know, you still define your RBAC in the same way, um, it, but you can link in this library or the sidecar or whatever that is capable of uh, caching that policy and um, enforcing it locally. It didn't they and, make that really good uh, for having authorization webhooks? And we I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And uh, we are already three minutes over. Um, so uh, I think we should uh, hold off on this discussion and maybe continue it in the SIG auth um, Slack channel. Um, apologies to the last item. Uh, let's uh, hoist that to next week's. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop recording.